We have four presentations and uh, we will start with uh, the host country. I'm eager to learn uh, the experience from Thailand. And uh, we have uh, uh, Net Napis Sushan Wanish. Sorry if I, but I think I pronounce very well your name. So you are welcome to give us experience from Thailand. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in this session, we, uh, it's a great pleasure for Thailand to share some experience uh, from streamlining of natural design of our vaccines by outsourcing to the private sector. Uh, before going into the detail, I would like to explain a bit for the the picture of the health insurance scheme in Thailand. Uh, from this picture, you can see that uh, in Thailand there are around the three, three or two, four main schemes. Uh, the first one we call the social security scheme, which will cover people in the uh, working place, such like in the factory, in the manufacturer, in the office. Uh, uh, right now, in Thailand is uh, around uh, nine to ten millions of the members in the social security scheme and the benefit will cover just only the employees only. Uh, the second one is the most perish ones. We call civil servant medical care scheme, which will cover not only the government uh, officer, but also will cover their parents, their spouse, and two of their children. Uh, and the rest for all, we call the member of a UC scheme. So it means that the, the people that not covered by any health insurance scheme, the subsidy from the government will be the members of a UC scheme. And right now, the rest of the people that not covered by any health insurance scheme is around uh, near uh, 50 million. It's uh, around uh, 78 percent. And uh, so far, we have also to cover uh, people in the we call the Nantai resident, uh, we call stateless people. The government uh, also subsidies some um, budget to uh, cover the treatment and uh, the prevention promotion for the stateless people also. All the people that uh, stay uh, live in Thailand will cover by one uh, any of the health insurance scheme that subsidy from the government. You can, can cannot go out uh, to the health insurance scheme except the one way is a date, okay? And all of the health insurance scheme have a very dynamic movement. If they out of work, they will automatically be the member of the UC scheme. The same at the CSMBS. <coughs> if they have a quit file or retire from the government office, they will automatically become uh, the member of UC scheme. Uh, from this picture, you can understand that uh, each health insurance scheme have their own uh, fund. Uh, they will have their own fund, but all the fund uh, will serve just only for the curative aspect only. But uh, for the prevention and promotion, the government will pay only to the UC scheme. So it means that all the vaccination uh, budget will subsidy directly to the UC fund. Uh, every year, uh, the National Health Security Office will propose the budget to the government, uh, which we call the capitation, uh, the annual capitation to the government. And you can see that uh, is actually that I think that this is a fact in so many countries. We will got uh, lower than what we have to propose to the government according to the concrete of the data, especially in the outpatient and prevention promotion data. We, it's very hard to defend to the government. Uh, most of the concrete data are in inpatient data. So that's why the increasing of the rate um, most of them are in inpatient expenditure. And, uh, but anyway, the administration board of the uh, UC scheme have uh, emphasized the prevention and promotion. So they, they have uh, to put more budget for the PP, for the prevention and promotion, although they cannot provide a very concrete data like uh, the treatment, the curative, uh, data. But the problems for uh, Thailand is that we got a very limited budget from the government, 
but we have to provide the access to care for a very huge amount of the patient to access the, uh, the medicine. We should have to provide uh, in enough and in efficacy way. But anyway, we have to sustain our budget. So how, how can we survive? The selection of any new license of vaccine in our national policy program, uh, we have to uh, consider through so many committee. The first one is the, we call the Advisory Committee on Immunisa Immunization Practice, uh, which will compose of so many experts from so many institutes in order to work together to consider any new license of vaccine. And then they have to uh, collaborate with the Prevention and Promotion Subcommittee, uh, which will be in the NHSO. Uh, the PMP Subcommittee will uh, propose the budget in the annual capitation uh, for all the uh, Thai uh, residents that how many proportion of the budget that we will allocate for the vaccine next year. But anyway, because we have a very limited budget, so all, and we have to prove that uh, all of the new licensed uh, vaccine are cost effectiveness. So that's why in Thailand we have uh, the way to approve through the sub another committee we call National Essential Drug List Subcommittee, which will compose of uh, so many working groups such as uh, for the vaccination, we have uh, another expert we call Infectious Disease and Vaccine Working Group. We have a Health Economic Working Group. And also if the price is not sustainable, we still have a price negotiation working group and coordination working group in order to approve uh, to our ED list. So it's a, I can say this is a tough job uh, for one li new licensed vaccine can be our benefit in Thailand. If they uh, have a budget impact, a high budget impact, uh, they have to approve uh, their cost effectiveness and sustainable for the affordable for the government or not uh, through the high tap. High tap is something we call HTAs in so many countries. It's a health technology assessment, but in Thai we call high tap. This uh, institution will prove uh, for the sustainable way for the government in order to subsidy for any new license of vaccine before we come into our essential drug list and then they will submit to our administration board and to be our benefit package for all. Uh, in the former of the distribution channels in Thailand, you can see this is a very long journey for one vaccine uh, that will go to our uh, patient. Uh, when the vaccine arrive at the Suvandapum airport, they have to stall at the national warehouse at the disease control department, which is under the Ministry of uh, Public Health. And then they will deliver to the regional warehouse, we call regional disease control warehouse, and deliver again to provincial health office warehouse, and again to the provincial ho hospital, and finally again to the primary care. So you can see there's a long journey for one vaccine can go through one warehouse to another warehouse. So it's very hard to control for the cold chain. And we spend and we invest a lot to stock the vaccine to each warehouse. So right now we have delegated uh, this responsibility to the government pharmaceutical organization, which we call in Thai GPO. GPO is a government pharmaceutical organization which will implement for all the whole the process, uh, begin from the central procurement central again for each kind of vaccine that we have a central procurement. And then they have to set uh, the software in order to uh, provide uh, for all of the hospital, we call contracting hospital. They can input their data into the website and then if the stock is go into the reorder point the gpo will deliver the vaccine directly to the contracting hospital and and uh, they will uh, have to deliver to the primary care family so you can see that uh, after we have just shortened the vet uh, just cut off some warehouse and shorten the distance by using 
uh, the software in order to control the order uh, directly from the contracting hospital to the uh, GPO. We call this uh, system VMI is called Vendor Managed Inventory. It means that the GPO will manage the inventory uh, instead of the uh, hospital. So this uh, it's a very easy to control the cold chain. So we have uh, to reform the cold chain at the central part at the GPO. Uh, we have to reform at the GPO side uh, for the vaccine that need uh, very, very cold and some need uh, the freezing room. So this have uh, implemented at the first year that we have delegated this responsibility to the GPO. When we also have a training for all the pharmacists at the contracting hospital, uh, to understand the well organized of the vaccine storage at the hospital side. So we have uh, to provide a refrigerator for all the contracting uh, hospital at the first year. Uh, and then they have to manage uh, to place the vaccine in a good manner with the airflow arrangement and clearly label for preventing for the dispensing errors. And also we provide the data locker to monitor for the temperature, but we provide the data locker just only the first two years only in order to set some, uh, we call standard, uh, standard uh, operation practice for the hospital. What happened? Uh, we can increase just only you, shut, you cut off the, uh, so many warehouse, you can decrease the purchasing budget of the EPI vaccine. Uh, at the beginning, we spent around 800 million. Right now, it's a go to a half, just only 400 million. Just only cut off the warehouse. We, you can see that from uh, the picture that uh, at the beginning, there are so many warehouse along the way that we deliver the vaccine to our, uh, our uh, members. But right now, we can cut down to just only uh, uh, 400. But next year, we will face another problem because uh, the WHO proposed uh, IPV for us, proposed a JE life for us, which are very expensive. So we have a very careful uh, to consider and how to make a transition period for, for our, uh, our scheme. Uh, the decreasing rate of the broken of the OPV, because Thailand, like Indonesia, like in Malaysia, because we are in the hot area, uh, so sometimes we we emphasize uh, too much to put uh, the vaccine too near, too close to the uh, dry eyes. So when the, the vaccine, they arrive to the hospital, most of them are broken already. So right now we have to try uh, to uh, test how, how many dry eyes they needed in one package and, and how far that we have to put the vaccine in the box. So right now we, we can uh, reform this already we can reduce the broken of the OPV from um, around 5% per month to 0, 0.0 right now. Uh, it's a trial and errors. And we also decreased the vested rate of the MMR packing side. Uh, in the past, it just uh, have only multiple dose of the MMR, but right now we have changed to single dose of the MMR. But we also, downside of the package, from 100 wide to just only uh, 10 per pack. So we, we can reduce the vested rate uh, from uh, near 40%, right now it's not more than 3%. And for the distribution problems from the hospital, uh, at the beginning we, we got a lot of complaint uh, from the hospital because it's just uh, the first year that we have implemented. And we try to sampling all the transactions per month and try to consolidate the problem and try to solve them. And right now the problem go down. The challenge in the future is uh, how can we reduce the vetted rate, not just only for the open valve, but from the unopened, from the expiry product. Uh, and the pr another problem is uh, utilization diverted from uh, the target population because in Thailand, so many experts, uh, they have to change the, the standard of the vaccination plan uh, for one children. So maybe the rate of the utilization have to change also. So you have to uh, carefully forecast for the next year plan and improve the culture and management distribution based practice. Uh, right now we didn't provide any data locker for the hospital because we have to set the standard of the operation uh, already, practice already. And you have to careful for the whole, whole cold chain monitoring and evaluation. 
And for the outbreak, right now we have to uh, separate our responsibility for the outbreak is the responsibility uh, from the, uh, the disease, but uh, from the routine service is the responsi responsibility from the NHSO. So all of the challenge is uh, have to work uh, through four to five years, and, and right now we, we think that we can overcome all the problems and we can go well, and I think the talent will maybe share this experience for another country. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, Jiao Kan Kwan from Ministry of Health Myanmar. Uh, he will tell us how they overcome limitations of cold chain space at all levels, health facility. So, please. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'm the Dr. Jiao Kan Kwan uh, from Myanmar. And the, with the global target and the, uh, the regional targets, Myanmar uh, has already contacted the, our ever largest miserable mass campaign in last January, February 2015. And thank you all the partners to supporting Myanmar uh, having a great success in the campaign. And as you all know, the, our country is in the mainland in the South Asia with the around the 135 ethnic group. And also, we have already administratively divided the country into the 14, uh, 17 state and region with a population around the 54 million. And our targets for the MR campaigns from the nine months to 15 years around the 13.9 million targets. And as you all know that the, our EPI supply chain system in Myanmar, we use the walking cooler freezers, and uh, national level and sub-national level and the function level, we use the Isla Freezer at Yusha at the country. And in our routine management schedule, we already included up to now the nine antigens. And then now we're trying to expand uh, at, at more new antigens like the PCV and the rotor and also IBV in line or the immunization program. And our current uh, supply chain systems is uh, we distribute the from the central core room situated in the, the Yangon, and uh, we take the responsibility, EPN take the responsibility to the, distribute the basin from the regional center port. And the lower level, the center port has to be take care of their own arrangement to take the basin and other logistics as a routine purpose. And then uh, we have the distribution channel of the, using the road system and also the air flight to transport all the hard to reach area and the peripheral area. And the coaching at all levels, uh, we have experience or only have the coaching space to tackle around the, around the five bad cohorts, that is, and all the way for the under five children, only have the experience or the tackling the campaign for the under five children. And we phase the campaign into the two phases as a school base and a community base. And also the school base campaign is also the very challenging for us because uh, we have no immunization program at school after now. And uh, we faced, uh, the, so the, the main reason for the phasing the two campaign, the flu phase campaign is due to the limited coaching space and the other logistic warehouses around the, at all level of the head facilities. So we conduct the two phase campaign and uh, our ministry, our minister already uh, inaugurated the uh, ceremony and also at the community phase as well. And let me explain you a, a little bit about the campaign management. And at the Central and Regional Committee, we organize and manage the Central Executive Committee, Regional Management Committee. And the subcommittee already technical advisory committee, social mobilization subcommittee, logistic management subcommittee, and financial, ma financial management subcommittee. These are committee we manage the campaign. And one of the most important ones is the logistic management subcommittee play a major role for successful conducting of the campaign. And then we conduct a series of the partnership uh, advocacy meetings at the central regional level and the township level as well. And the advocacy to the Ministry of Education, since it is involved with the Ministry of Education and School Based Campaign. And also advocacy to the Nyama Medical Association, Nyama Medical Child Welfare Association, other INGOs, and the UN agency. And uh, this uh, feature showed that the, what, uh, we have already conducted a series of the uh, coordination meetings to make this happen 
the, the very smooth implementation of the campaign at the central sub-national level committees and also NGO advocacy and the township level technical training, including the coach and logistic management. Here are some challenges. The existing school-based immunization program not established, as I mentioned earlier, and immunization program in all of school children and adolescents is very challenging for us, and the AEFI issue in the students is a very, very challenging for the program. And also, phase-wide campaign with the high targets, we have no experience. And operational and socially conflict area around the Thailand, Myanmar border, China, Myanmar border, and also physically hard to reach area. It's also challenging to reach the cold chains and the other vaccine and the logistic. And the operational in the self-administrated areas, we have the seven self-administrated region uh, according to the, the new constitution. Here's a some physical barrier. We have to use the SAM, the hard to reach area. We have to use the, the support from the, the helicopters from the Ministry of Defense. And also the healthcare worker has to pass through the very, very challenging and the geographic area. Here's uh, some challenges and uh, what we solve for the solution for it make, happens for the logistic management for the campaign. The first one is the HR. Human resource limitations and we recruit temporary staff with the support from the UNICEF, WHO and other partners. And limitation of the central medical sector pool staff. This also we are using, the EPN supplies has been using for the central medical CMST and also we also hire the temporary logistician to make it happen for the campaign. And also, such as the custom clearance, the, the registration of the vaccines, such, and all the new products, we hire the private agent. And uh, shortage of the vaccine store at all level, uh, we install total of the, the, the six walking cooler freezer uh, nationally and the sub nationally. And then uh, we all also allocated the, around the, the one the 31 aisles and the 133 freezer at the township level, and also as well the solar refrigerator as well. And also the expansion of the basin, the, the containers, we distributed basin carrier, plastic container, whole boxes, and the, also the auto burrage regulator as well for to install. All these efforts has been already made with the special support from the, our partners, WHO and UNICEF. And also warehouse capacity, Due to the limited limitation in the currently relying on the CMSC system, we temporarily hire the warehouses uh, and the, we store all the logistic and the, we distribute it from the central hub to the other regional hubs. And also, only we are using the paper transaction for the, our currently relying on the CMSC system. All the, the supply has been directly uh, shipped to the, all the, uh, the destination. And also, country in the process of the coaching expansion plan for the new vaccine introduction, the coming the 2016, we'll be introducing with the support from Gavi, and we introduce the PCV vaccine. It is all, you all know that it is a challenging for the country because the PCV is quite the space occupying ones. And our integrated supply chain system management that is already assisted by the USAID and the SEMS supply chain system, we are in stay in process. And the EVN, we have already lost EVN in 2011, and then now the new EVN uh, with the CEVN, now we in place, now currently in the assessment state. And National Immunization Program gave analysis for the cold chain has for the MR campaigns where we conduct a series of the meeting with the subnational focus and the, also the township focus. And also we update our cold chain inventory with the so many data elements, and I thank you, Mr. Tiki, for our coaching is consultant for making his happen for the scenario-based coaching expansion plan. Also, the, we developed the coaching investment plan as well, for even for the non-EPI commodities, because the EPI has to be taking care of the non-EPI issue. So here's uh, some the, the photo document that we distributed the dry container, shipping container around the country. And the coordination at the national level, as I mentioned earlier, and the sub-national level, and the VHS training and the micro planning tools developed and the technical and logistic management training was conducted at all level. And what we lesson learned at the way forward for the country, the cold chain and logistic <coughs> management is the strengthened supply chain management based on the lesson learned for the, this MR campaign. We have a good, a very good experience. And also in the supply and management and plan for the HR capacity varying for the management of the supply chain. And the what based supply tracking system we are now able to install with this and some other software currently depending on the paper base. And a coaching management based on the UNICEF ready to call for action. And thank you.
this is our country experience, what we struggle with the, our AMA uh, campaign, and all the, the partners appreciated our, our efforts, and that this has to be shared with the TechNet Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I invite uh, William Musubire from Ministry of Health, Uganda, uh, to tell us uh, the lessons learned from supply chain integration yes. uh, and improving vaccine management using the EDM approach. Okay. Thank you and good morning, everyone. So we are going to look at uh, lessons learned from. Uh, from improving vaccine management using the, EVM, the mic, using the EVM approach in Uganda. So, uh, my presentation actually is going to run uh, as a, I'm going to walk you through the country context, then I, I, I take you uh, through some bit of uh, how the integration has happened in Uganda, how it has worked, the EVM, the EVM assessment that we had recently and some, with some keynotes, and then, and lastly, we shall look at the benefits of the integration in Uganda. For the country context, uh, Uganda is, uh, is located in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's along the equator with a, with a population of 34 million. Um, and the, and the, most, the most interesting thing about Uganda is that 50% of the population is under 15 years. So we've got a very young uh, population. And um, we have achieved some things in the, in the Millennium Development Goals we have, uh, uh, in terms of infant mortality. We were at 150 uh, deaths, right, but now we are at 69. And then for the for the for the number of births that are, that are, that that do happen in hospitals, we are at 58. But still, the, there's a big chunk that are, that go to the to the birth attendants. We still have some challenges. The government expenditure <coughs> on health is still low, uh, and uh, and uh, we also have um, uh, some good GDP uh, as a country. Uh, in terms of supply chain integration, uh, when you compare 2011 and 2014, we, have, uh, we, we, had, uh, we had five layers back in, 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 in 2011. And uh, then uh, this changed, and by, by, by 2014, there was a change up to three layers. Uh, the key things were following the results of, of the EVM in 2011. There were some poor results that did happen. And, uh, in the EVM in terms of, of distribution and in terms of vaccine management that forced uh, a change in the, in the change of the layers in supply chain. And uh, the key improvements that we, we've seen with this change uh, have been that uh, uh, for the supply of, um, of vaccines at the national level, it has reduced from, from eight weeks up to two weeks. We can move uh, vaccines from the, from, the, from the national vaccine store to the entire, to, to the uh, to the whole country within only two weeks, and also um, the capacity at the national vaccine store has increased uh, from 12 weeks up to 16 weeks with the same capacity. We've done some improvements in uh, in increasing the shelving of the uh, uh, of the national vaccine store by, by adding in some extra racks. Then, uh, and then we had some improve on uh, on the storage on the storage capacity. So. Um, So, um, in 2012, uh, following the, uh, with the poor results of the EVM, the government of Uganda uh, thought it wise that uh, they moved some functions of logistics from, from the EPI to the national medical stores. And uh, the, the key reason for this was to use the vast warehousing knowledge of the national medical stores that they had, and also to use the trucks, because uh, by then NMS had huge coal trucks of 48 meters tubed each. Uh, these are big coal trucks that we had by then. And then also to use the vast uh, the expertise in logistics of the people at, at national medical stores to try and, and improve uh, vaccine storage and distribution. And also for issues of sustainability in the long term, how do you, how do you sustain? Uh, those, are the, those are the four main reasons of moving some of the functions of, of logistics from the EPI but, uh, into, into the functions of, of NMS. So uh, how it works, uh, the blue, uh, those brown squares uh, before, 
2011, those were the key functions that were used by, in the EPI. The EPI basically was involved in policy formulation, setting standards, in supervision, training, monitoring, and evaluation, and also storage and distribution. But with the change, the function of storage and, and distribution was moved away from the EPI into uh, international medical stores. But now, what, what normally happens now, we do work hand in hand with the partners as UNICEF, CHI, and PATH, and this has, uh, and this has improved the vaccine management uh, in, in the country. The one thing that we normally do as a team is the vaccine forecasting. We normally, when to, uh, if it happens, we, we, all, we all come as a team and do the forecasting as a, as a group, the national forecasting. So, uh, uh, in, um, in 2012, when this, when, when this integration did happen, uh, the key functions that were moved to NMS, the one was, uh, uh, the first key function was NMS was in charge of patrolling vaccines, of course using UNICEF, and then we also in charge of storing vaccines, and then also the distribution of vaccines from the National Vaccine Store down to the DBS. But now starting 2014, they are adding on extra roles, and uh, the other thing that, w that uh, has been a, a very big challenge is the, is the, is the last mile. So they want NMS to go on and also finish off with the last mile of, of vaccines. And also some bit of, of maintenance, and especially at the district level. So a, we, have, we still have some challenges of maintenance at the district level. So, so NMS has to start on, uh, on the last mile <coughs> and maintenance at the district level of, of all the equipment. The EVM, uh, uh, following that, in 2014, we had, we had uh, an EVM assessment, and we had very, uh, very big improvements in terms of, of EVM. And out of uh, the nine criteria, the NVS actually did score seven, which were above 80%, uh, uh, if you compare that with the one that did occur in 2011. So there was a very big improvement following the, the integration. Then uh, uh, walking through some of the some of the criteria, some of the key criteria that uh, that had strong improvements uh, in terms of storage and transport ca capacity, uh, NMS uh, we use. There have been some several several changes. Uh, the one key thing that that uh, that we that we had was the was the improvement in dry storage. Before everything was uh, in uh, big warehouses, no rocks, they were all block stacked, but now everything is is rocked and and it's barcoded, everything's well tracked uh, in a modern way. Um, we have also introduced uh, the use of uh, coal trucks, big, very big coal trucks, and uh, this improvement is actually, uh, for, and for the future, what we, what we want, the key challenge that we have now is, uh, is the issue of supplying gas, because uh, we normally supply gas to the whole country every month, and uh, the budget for Uganda for, is a bit limited. So we see the only way to have it more sustainable is to change from, uh, from, from gas fridges to solar fridges uh, to have better sustainability. And then uh, if that does happen, then we shall need some capacity building in terms of how to, how to, how to install and maintain the solar fridges. We shall need some support in that area. And also we have uh, uh, about 60% uh, of the country is, is electrified. So we're also lobbying with the districts to, to uh, just turn on and use most of these fridges onto, onto the, on the main grid as opposed to running it on, on gas to have it more, more sustainable. So um, in terms of um, the long-term vision, uh, we have had uh, in the last 10 years uh, several applications for increase of cold storage at the National Vaccine Store. And uh, recently we have, we have had an approval of seven working cold rooms and uh, this is expected as, uh, okay, with this increase, we shall have the, our capacity at the National Vaccine Store to go on until 2018. Thereafter, again, we shall, be, we shall have a shortfall. But we have had another thinking uh, uh, at the national level. We are thinking that why do we always have to have these multiple, these multiple applications of several cold rooms, small, these small cold rooms? We, we want to have a, one big driving, driving cold room. And we, have a big, we want to have one big driving cold room for the future so, so that we can have some long-term uh, so, long, okay, long storage, storage and have more time for whatever, for focusing on other operations. On other operations. Because uh, what we are seeing is that um, 
if after five years there's a when there's a review, we have got a, we have got capacity constraint and we must reapply for for smaller code rooms. So what we want uh, for the future, can we shift from the small working code rooms to one big massive drive-in code room? That's what we want for the long term uh, future. So maybe if that is approved, uh, then we would need some technical we need some support in how to design these big code rooms and then uh, basically in terms of of the layout in maximizing space of those big driving codes, if it does happen. In terms of stock management, uh, the key learnings that we saw from the from the recent from the recent EVM was that uh, uh, we need to have, there was a, there was some regular stock, okay most of the most of our records were not up to date, and uh, we have done some work on on improving that at all levels. And also, we have also seen that uh, uh, the issue of keeping whatever uh, we've, we've also emphasized the importance of keeping stock records because uh, this is key in reviewing the performance and uh, and also in the reporting and also in report analysis if it does happen. But also, we also want to, uh, we also saw that there's need to have uh, some some information. Okay. The information at various levels is not exchanged, it's, it's in silos. The information at the, at the lower level is not easily moved up to, to move up to the center, and we have that big challenge of, uh, of getting data for whatever, for, for reporting and analysis. So we need uh, some support in, uh, in, the, in these tools, in the WHO tools, uh, like the DSMT, DVDMT, and also how can we integrate these tools all work as, a, uh, as the same, uh, and Twitter link and have all the data at the center to have uh, some central reporting of all the information at all levels. That's what we want to have in the future in terms of stock management. Then uh, in terms of maintenance, um, we have had several, several breakdowns uh, which, are, which are so frequent, mainly at the, at the low facility levels, and uh, we, we have no preventive maintenance. Uh, most of it actually is reactive maintenance, whereby people just go and react when there's a breakdown. So, and also there are no maintenance, there are no records of maintenance uh, at most levels, and the SOPs of maintenance are, uh, are still not up to date. We have got so we've got some new equipment coming in, but 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 the SOPs don't change as fast as uh, as the new equipment keep coming into the country. So, what have we learned from this? Mm. We need, to add, we need to use these records of maintenance so that we can see the skills gaps for both the users and the technicians. We also need to update our call chain inventory. We have just done one uh, in the last six months uh, by the help of CHAI. We also need to review these records for, the, uh, for future application or, or, or future equipment because we've seen that some equipment actually don't work well and others have given us trouble. So we want to review these records and know those equipment that have given us trouble and we don't apply for them in the next, uh, in the next applications. And also we have, we have now begun having uh, some reporting on maintenance at the country, at the API meetings every month so that we can strengthen uh, on maintenance. So we need some support in developing uh, the preventing uh, maintenance whatever plans and also some SOPs in, uh, in the solar to deploy whatever systems, if they are, if they are in, we shall need some support in those areas. Management, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of MIS, the key things that we saw is uh, most of our data actually is in silos and is able to paper best, and there's no, and there's no snapshot visibility of the key indicators in a single time. So what, what we want, we want to have all this data to be linked. We have got so many tools uh, which, are, which are running in the country. We want them all to, to be linked into, into, into one center that we can have one visibility for all the, indi for, for, for all the key indicators of API. Distribution, again, like what other countries have been mentioning, we also have uh, a key challenge in terms of last mile. And uh, we want to have a, a supply chain modeling for, for last mile. And also, if there are any new, if there are any new, if there are, if there are new innovations yeah, of passive carriers, want to know if there is something new from this conference, and also if there is a possibility for for the shift from use of this, uh, from the, want to have 
the policy shift and useful facts. Because currently what we are using is a uh, desk that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are, which are conditioned. So we want to have a policy shift in that area. In vaccine management, uh, the key thing is uh, we have so much wastage and uh, we have not been tracking it, but now our KFS is now is, uh, is, on, uh, is on tracking vaccine wastage at all levels, and we shall need some more support in how to make it uh, better in that area. In terms of integration, uh, we shall have more discussions on this in the afternoon, but the, but the key thing is that we have got a, uh, well, we have a committee that, uh, that, uh, that does uh, that, that manage all the, all the logistics in, uh, in supply chain in the country. But uh, uh, so in the afternoon, we shall go into details of, of this and then no more characters being working. So thank you very much, and that's what we got from the Uganda. Thank you, William. Now we have the presentation from uh, UNICEF Somalia, so Douglas Mukwaya, uh, on uh, challenges in a fragile country. As you all know, Somalia is, has some challenges in terms of security, etc. How they overcome that, please. Douglas. Hello. All right, uh, I've just noticed that uh, everybody has been forgetting other colleagues who are out there, so I would say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> so I'm here to present uh, the immunization supply chain challenges in the fragile state, as all of you know about uh, Somalia. And uh, straight away, we'll move to this graph that everybody has been seeing, and the reason why I put it is one. It's the same supply chain as everybody knows how vaccines move. But uh, I would say one of the challenges that we're facing like in uh, Somalia is the planning and uh, estimation uh, defining storage capacity is done by UNICEF. But the rest, which is to do with uh, monitoring and uh, data flow back, is done by uh, WHO. So when you look at the six rights that we've got, one of it is quality and uh, quantity. However, cost also comes in. So there's a challenge in between whereby if you're giving vaccines and you don't have the data flowing back directed to you is one of the challenges. So what, what we are doing right now is we're trying to come up with uh, tools that at least we can have data readily available probably at the end of the month rather than waiting for WHO two, three months for you to send back the data. So uh, that arrow just shows you the way vaccines are brought in and uh, of course the way information flows back from, uh, flows back from the field. Uh, I would just want to give an example of uh, one of the cold chain hubs, that is South Central Zone. As you are aware that uh, Somalia is divided in two, three zones, and all the three zones have got different administrations. What I mean, all the three zones have got different presidents, and they have got their own challenges. So the hardest in all the three is South Central. Those of you who know the geography of uh, Somalia, and uh, the way vaccines move is uh, We've got uh, seven hubs, and those hubs are uh, divided in two regions, how the vaccines move. So Mogadishu is one of them, uh, Dusamareb is the other, and it supplies the regions that you're seeing below. And on the map, you can see the circles, and they can tell you where the regions are located. Then we've got El Badi, Baidoa, Beltoa, Kismayo, and Afamado. So when it comes to logistics distribution, you find that some of these regions are, uh, sorry, regions are supplied directly from Nairobi. Then at a certain time you will see as we go on, you find that some of them are supplied uh, from, uh, from Mogadishu. So what do I mean in this? Mode of supply is uh, either we get all these vaccines from Nairobi to those hubs, of course by air, you can't go by road, then we've got mode B. Mode B means getting vaccines from uh, Mogadishu. We supply them from uh, Nairobi to Mogadishu. Then from Mogadishu, we can use other flights to the different locations, as you saw the first graph. And uh, 
the different arrows are clearly shown down there. Either it's a commercial flight, either it's a domestic flight, or it is a UN flight, UNHAS flight. Then you find that other vaccines are supplied by road, that last blue arrow, from, from Kenya, but by road through the borderline, because it is easier. There's no air strip that side. So you can see the kind of complicity I'm trying to talk about when it comes to the distribution part of it. So, vaccine, vaccine supply chain management transition. What it was before and where we are at the moment. Initially, at the beginning of the outbreak, when I went to Somalia, vaccines were being supplied on a monthly basis. Every month, a plane has to go to all the seven lo locations. But as we speak, speak now, we've got at least stock for around uh, two to three months stock. Here you can see on the presentation is showing one to two, but I think it is two to three. And uh, this was made possible by assessing the different hubs to make sure that uh, we've got enough cold chain equipment, we've got staff that are trained to handle vaccines in order to avoid uh, any wastages around. So as you look at the slide, it shows you right now as I speak, six of the eight cold chain hubs have been assessed in terms of uh, capacity, equipment, human resource, and security. And uh, when it comes also to the cost implications, the commercial flights were quite expensive because one round trip would make around $80,000. That is for a month. But as we speak now, we shall see that uh, the cost has relatively come down because of uh, harmonizing, having other humanitarian services, getting goods together, and probably cost sharing, which at a flight, for example, with uh, OCHA, UNDP, everybody puts on these goods and we share the costs. So the, price, uh, the prices have relatively come down. And uh, the other thing also I wanted to bring out here is like uh, funding for routine immunization is quite low. And you find that most of the distributions are done using the polio funds. So we're using the polio assets to improve routine immunization. The worry is that when the polio funds are off, what will happen to routine immunization? That is one of the puzzles that is still available that we're trying to figure out. So I put in this map just to show you some of the places that are, uh, when you look at those red colors, I don't know if it is shown there. Yeah, the red, those are places that we cannot access. We can't go in because they are controlled by uh, Al-Shabaab. So we can't go into these places. And uh, we have to use different means to see that we have the kids down there get immunization. And uh, red is very high, of course. There is high, then there is medium. The more you go in the north, the more it becomes more secure. Then the more you come to the south, the more it becomes more tricky and needs more, more planning. Yeah, so those are some of the cold chain hubs that we've got in, uh, in Somalia. I know you'll, some of you are already asking yourselves, you showed us a red and you are seeing fridges down there. So there are deep freezers, of course, ice liners and uh, solar fridges in all the different places. So how do we manage this? We are doing this using partners. In South Central Zone, I would say UNICEF is running everything on behalf of government. And for us to be able to reach down there, we have to use partners. How they reach down there, <laughs> that is a different discussion. So all what we want to start, we want to get those kids really having immunization at the right time. So those are the fridges that we've got down there. And uh, some of the challenges that we are facing, you'll see that I'm giving most of the challenges on uh, scenarios in South Central Zone. One is limited road access. Of course, uh, there's limited availability of commercial flights. Then uh, changing scenario. Today, the place is okay. Tomorrow, they will tell you it has been taken over. So what do you do? So those are some of the challenges that we are facing in South Central Zone. So you can't be so sure of the fridge you installed today that tomorrow it will be there. But some, somehow, somewhere, we are trying to manage and uh, making things move. So what does it take? Remember, the slide previously showed us that uh, the cost implication is around $80,000 for distribution of vaccines in a month. But this was just a snapshot of uh, the last September, October, and November. And when I tried to add up here, I tried to see that at least we've tried to move from 80000 in a month 
and somewhere, sometimes it's around 64, or somewhere it's around 50 something. So how have we done that? We've done this in collaboration, uh, in, uh, we've been collaborating with other UN agencies. They have put some free flights, but you need to plan for them, and they need to look also on the priority list. What should we take first? So we've been able to plan ahead and have some of space on uh, flights like UNHAS, UNDSS flights, those are free flights. WFP is also partly paid for, but almost uh, free. So when you do quick planning and forward planning, it helps us to really have our goods, uh, refrigerators and uh, vaccines and uh, syringes and needles delivered on time. Uh, again, to come to the cost impact, commercial flights, as I told you, the round flight is $800, $8,000, but it's coming down. Then the other one is the system can be extended to EPI activities. Yeah, we tried to sit in, uh, we, we sat in the meeting and uh, probably focused, we tried to look at the health system and try to look at what weighs most. Is it EPI? Is it the nutrition part of it? Is it uh, probably taking plant nuts or what, what should they really put into consideration? So we find that uh, vaccines were given a slot and uh, this really helps us in terms of delivering vaccines right on time. So what are the ongoing challenges to reach the effective vaccine management standards? One, implementation of uh, the EVM recommendations at the National Vaccine Store is not easy as planned. As uh, our vaccine store is, the National Vaccine Store in Nairobi is being uh, outsourced and it is uh, Kona Naga trying to handle vaccines at the National Vaccine Store. So it's hard for us to go and try to implement some of the recommendations because the other one is a private entity. So it's one of the challenges. Then the other one is a lack of skilled uh, human resource in the relevant supply chain offices, especially at the lower levels, that is within Somalia. Then planned activities are not often carried out as planned due to numerous reasons. Of course, security reasons. Then the bureaucracy of accessing funds is also one of the challenges. It's not easy to access funds, especially when you pass it over to the ministry or to the partners. Then, of course, the other challenges that faced are information, resource, and security. This I won't go through because it is self-explanatory. When I talk about the information flow, you saw it in the beginning. When I talk about the resource and the security part of it, it's clearly illustrated in the slides. And, uh, the other challenge is, of course, people have been talking about the innovations moving away from the kerosene fridges to the solar, direct, uh, the, to the SDD. And as I speak, last year we lost around, I think, uh, three health facilities because of uh, fuel-related problems. The fuel is not good. You find that sometimes they put diesel mixed with kerosene in the fridges, and that's what happens. So there is also some quick review that we're trying to do to see how we can pull out solar uh, kerosene fridges and replace them probably with the solar direct drive fridges. Transport and distribution challenges, access and constraints, those ones we've talked about them and uh, there are very many. If we started going two one by one, we can spend the whole day on this. So of course the road network, limited infrastructure, the roads, uh, sorry, the rains also, sometimes when it over rains, then also the plane cannot land. So those are some of the other challenges. So what are the five key focus areas for 2014, 2015? One is the logistics management information system that we're trying to put in place. The cold chain and logistics gap analysis, which we're trying to also to start in around probably in uh, July to see where we need more capacity and uh, what are the challenges. Then of course the EVM follow-up assessment and improvement plan, we're trying to look into that. Introduction of the 30-day temperature monitoring system. As I told you that uh, We've got fridges in some places that really are inaccessible. So we don't know what is happening to the vaccines, if it's been given in the right condition, right quality, something like that. And of course, we're dwelling on capacity building also as a major plan for these coming years. So what are some of the recommendations that we are thinking about? One is using IT for real-time monitoring. What am I talking about here? It's a from the experience that we've got, we are trying to look at if there could be some innovations that can come up, probably like having vaccine refrigerators installed with remote temperature monitoring devices, 
such that if somebody out there has a fridge, somebody centrally can monitor the temperatures. Probably we shall learn more from, I've seen from one of the presentations. Then the other one is having uh, barcodes for fridges. I don't know if it is possible. It is something that just came to my mind. I'm thinking of in terms of stock management. If somebody puts uh, probably a box of vaccine in the fridge, is it possible to code it and probably send the signal that stock has gone out, stock has come in? Because it's one of the challenges that we are facing in terms of uh, having stock, stock reports. So we're trying to see, is there an automated way that something can be done that we can have these reports quite on time? And uh, those are questions that I thought that we could leave for the whole congregation just to think about. And with that, I would say thank you. Thank you, Douglas, uh, for your presentation. It reminds me of my early days on immunization in Dear Congo during the war. So it needs a lot of sacrifice. Keep it up, please. So, Jeff, okay. for the question. So we have a little more time. We have about 20 minutes now. And we're going to try to manage it a little differently. Some of the staff is going to help uh, move the microphones around. So if you just have a question, put up your hand and they'll come find you and then we'll call on you, okay? Start with Dimitri. Thank you very much. Um, it's not a question really, it's a comment. I couldn't help thinking uh, when Douglas was presenting on Somalia, just how easy we have it everywhere. And the positive thought to us all, if we can negotiate with the, the, these circumstances, if we can understand how the Al-Shabaab controlled area works, and we still go and we reach those kids, and we have the energy to think about the optimization of system, efficiency of system, there's no excuse really for us to not really reflect on our own circumstances in all those other countries which are much simpler compared to this context and understand how those systems work. Thank you. I have I have a question for the Thai experiment experience. I was part of a team that was evaluating or observing a little bit the NRA uh, oversight of the distribution system. It's louder, and please. at that time, we had observed that actually your distribution is dependent on a private system and a courier system. And there were certain uh, gaps which were observed there. So I would be interested to know what kind of training is being imparted to the distributors, the courier company, and what type of monitoring is being done to assure proper deliveries timely deliveries because typically untrained people consider vaccine just as any other commodity and they don't make any difference between potatoes and vaccines. So I would be interested to know. Okay. Let's, let's, let's take a couple more and then we'll, we'll go to the answers. Um, over here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to the presenters. Um, it's for uh, Uganda. Um, at which point we have a big challenge in, uh, in many countries in regards to the number of code rooms that we have to install versus to build a code room uh, compared to, uh, to the working code rooms. And uh, we don't know exactly at which point it will be more cost effective to have built in code rooms versus working code rooms. And do you have this uh, kind of cost analysis? Uh, because you said that uh, there was a need of seven code rooms and you, you, you took the option uh, to build uh, a huge code room of 700 uh, cubic meters. Uh, do we have some uh, cost analysis, not only in terms of construction, but maintenance, but also in terms of risk analysis, if uh, something, the risk of breakdown, etc. So uh, I will be much interested in that. Thank you. I'm, 
I'm Dr. Hola. Uh, sir, I have one question. Like all the countries who have presented, uh, it is concerned with only what the government is doing. In any of these countries or in all of these countries, do the private doctors vaccinate, number one? Number two, is it monitored? Sorry. Yeah, we couldn't quite understand. Can you repeat uh, that microphone? I'm not sure. Can you just repeat the question? No, in these countries, do the private doctors vaccinate? If they vaccinate, whether that has been monitored? The private doctors. Private doctor. Who is the private sector vaccinated? Oh, for the private sector, yeah. okay. Yeah. Can I, sir? All right, one more, and then we'll go to answers over there. Uh, Actually, in uh, a couple of reports uh, that I was uh, mentioning about challenges related to outsourcing and challenging to, uh, challenges to monitor uh, private uh, companies to, to monitor the uh, supply chain. And my question is, what, would, what is the is country experience, how to handle those challenges? Have they uh, had any experience working together with national regulatory authorities for, for uh, drugs on that or any other options? Because that becomes as an important challenge. As, uh, 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 as soon as we have more players in place, we have to think really very carefully how all players follow the same rules. Who monitors, who is let's say, uh, authorized to do it, who has the capacity to do it, who, who makes sure that that capacity is in place. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's take one more, sorry. Okay. So yeah. yeah, thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Um, just the question um, to, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for really excellent presentations uh, for Thailand and um, colleagues. Uh, I have <coughs> just one question. I see that I saw a uh, really impressive uh, reduction in the budget you allocated to the vaccines due to all the changes you implemented. Uh, and I wanted to know, especially for the uh, MMR vaccine, or MR vaccine you've seen, uh, the wasted weight, the wasted drop from more than 35% to around 3%, uh, thanks to those uh, efforts. Concretely, how, how this has reflected in terms of shifting this presentation because I know many countries wanted to sh make that move, but the, the fear of initial prices of the single dose presentations make a sort of barrier. How did you come to that and how do you monitor exactly that, that, that progress? The, um, the second question is to William. Uh, thanks for a really impressive presentation for this implementation of the changes from the from the the structure of the vaccine management from the epi vertical program to the integrated mms and one of the challenges is that how do you implement on the nms level the monitoring of the wastage we know that wastage uh, is a programmatic aspect instead of supply chain necessary uh, meaning uh, the wastage of in open vials that is linked to the service uh, delivery. How the MMS will implement that? Okay, um, let's start with uh, Dr. Net. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's so many questions involving talent experience. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, introduce a bit about the GPO. Uh, GPO is not the private sector. GPO is a government. Uh, it's a one of the state agency under the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, we dedicate uh, re the responsibility for the vaccination management to GPO uh, for whole the process, uh, the beginning at the bargain, at the central bargain. So we, we can uh, cut down a lot of budget uh, according to the bag central bargaining because we can know uh, the amount of the vaccine that we will buy next year. So we have a central bargain uh, just only one time per year before around the eighth month before we, we have to uh, purchase. So uh, 
according to our centralized database, we, we can forecast very uh, concrete uh, for the amount of the vaccine next year, and we have a very big discount for the vaccine price. And for the, the distribution, distribution plan, uh, according to the cut of the so many warehouse, uh, just only cut off uh, so many warehouse, you can cut down uh, the vestige uh, of the vaccination that's stuck in, uh, in so many uh, warehouse. So that's why we can that cut down. Uh, the two reasons that we can cut down the budget, the first one is from the bargain, from the negotiation. The second is from the cut down of the warehouse. And the, for the uh, distribu uh, for the uh, downsides of the decreasing of the vestige of MMR, because uh, fortunately, the Sintal and the GPO they have the joint uh, have had the joint uh, company that they can manufacture and filling the uh, vaccines in Thailand. So we, we can propose some new recommendation to the GPO in order to modify the packaging of the MMR that in the past we have to pack into multiple dose, in 10 dose, in uh, 100 wire in one package. It's a, a lot of the vessels rich. But right now, we just a chain move to modify into single dose and downside the package into just only 10 wire per pack. So. We, we are easy to control because in Thailand, because we have delegate uh, to GPO and we have uh, to negotiate with GPO to modify some process inside, not just only in price, but also in packaging and also in distribution, plan distribution process. And uh, not all the vaccine that the GPO can deliver to the provide providers. Sometimes they have to uh, contract with the private sector and they have to control the private sector instead of uh, National Health Security Office. The way that we control the, the cold chains in Thailand at the beginning, uh, we implement data logger in order to monitor the process and try uh, to uh, control uh, the temperature during the deliver uh, uh, travel or the journey uh, until to the contracting provider. So uh, it's uh, have to try uh, year by year in order to set the standard operation practice uh, for GPO to monitor for the private sector. So the private sector does not mean the GPO. It means the company that the uh, GPO that have to a special contract with them. We still have another two contact with the private sector. And I think that data locker will be useful just only for the, uh, at the beginning, just only to set up, uh, to establish the standard of practice. And after that, it's no need for data locker anymore. Dr. Kyo, anything Oops. for you? Before we can die. No. 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 Okay. William? Um, there was some question from Serge uh, uh, concerning the drive-in courtrooms. He was asking about uh, if we have done risk analysis and, a, and cost analysis. Uh, as I said in the presentation, it's a long-term vision that we want, uh, but we have done some benchmarking in some countries in, in Europe and in South Africa, and, uh, we, and what we've seen that uh, most of the national vaccines are not stored in uh, in cold rooms like what we have. They all have drive-in cold rooms. Uh, we've done some benchmark with them and they've, and they've, and they've given us some good insights that uh, it's manageable. So that's where actually, that's where the whole idea came from. Why is, that, why is it that in Africa we have these small cold rooms and in Europe they have these big massive drive-in cold rooms? Why are we always in the application process? So if, the, if it can be done in Europe, then we can also do it in Africa. So we shall maybe go back to them and uh, get all these facts clear. Uh, on how much it costs and, uh, and the risks, if there are any, then we'll see how we can, we can put an application in that, uh, in that area. Then the other one was, on, was from, uh, from Kone. He was asking about how, how NMS is going to manage uh, the issue of wastage. Wastage is managed uh, as a team, but uh, for NMS's case, uh, why, why it has been given to us is... Uh, is, is because NMS has a, a much bigger presence in the districts and uh, in, the, in the entire country. We have monthly supplies of vaccines. So we do reach out to most of these centers every month. So what the program wants us to do, they have designed all the tools of, uh, 
of wastage, we shall, we shall take them down, and, and every month on the way back, we shall bring back all the information and compile it at the center and then submit it back to, back to the ministry. So that's how, the, that's how the, the whole model is going to work. So we shall, basically, our, uh, uh, the whole part of NMS is moving the tools down and getting back the information and giving, then, and then meeting, and giving it back to the ministry for, their, for the deep analysis to be done. That's how we shall be doing it. Douglas, anything you wanted to add? We have time for maybe two more questions. Tiki, here. Not a question, but maybe just to add a comment, which many people tend to overlook is every single warehouse in the distribution chain has a minimum stock holding permanently. It's not an empty store where you deliver the monthly supply and then take it out again. So you build up normally a safety stock in every level of warehousing. And that adds a tremendous cost your supply chain and a previous question asked and I would imagine it, ha it happened in Thailand how could they reduce their expenditure so dramatically um, I think uh, the Uganda experience uh, did you see how they played around with the safety stock without expending more they didn't increase their expenditure because they could reduce their number of warehouses so often. Just another comment um, on drive-in cold rooms. I was part of uh, an EDM assessment of the cold room in Cape Town, South Africa, where they have a 20,000 cubic meter drive-in cold room. And it's all automated. The maintenance is fully computerized. And the whole warehouse is managed by three people. So I think the economies of scale would kick in very seriously when you start looking at that type of technology. But I still don't know where the break-even point is between walk-in cold rooms and drive-in cold rooms. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a little bit around the task shifting. I think uh, even in the in the first series of presentations, there was there were a few comments on on task shifting. Um, just for the case of Mozambique, uh, when we start thinking about changing the distribution system from multi-tire to loops, one of the biggest challenges we have is uh, that, as was mentioned, uh, the officers at the levels that are jumped by the loops, they lose their roles and uh, they are not accountable anymore for what happens in the health facilities that they used to have oversight to. So I'd like to listen a little bit. There was one mentioned that uh, the function of logistics uh, is, the, is moved to the higher level. So I'd like to understand a little bit more. What is the role of the people who have lost that, uh, um, that accountability now? If vaccines in their health facilities go out of stock or overstock, do they have any accountability role over that or not? And how, how do you manage this? Because for us, it has been a challenge. Thank you. OK, for me. Okay, uh, I think that uh, you have to establish for the chain management because the, in the past, most of the staff uh, in the Ministry of Public Health, they have to work like uh, operation uh, work. But uh, after we have to move the operation work to the GPO uh, to work instead, 
So the staff under the Ministry of Public Health will become the, a bit the, like an uh, advisory of the expert to, uh, to advise uh, NHSO and the pharmacists in the regional area, uh, how can you uh, control uh, the cold room or the refrigerator? How can you well decide uh, to place the vaccine inside? So the, the, respons uh, the responsibility have to move from an opera operation to the advisory part. So right now we got a lot of uh, advisory, uh, ad Ad, uh, advice uh, from the ministry uh, expert. I think that it's the real duty from uh, the Ministry of Public Health staff is to advise and to set the strategy for the uh, vaccination program for us, not to set the operation and just to take a call that uh, the vaccine is as a shot now and to try to send the vaccine to the, the hospital. So I think this is a very big change in talent. You put right man in the right job because the, all of the experts are in the Ministry of Public Health. The, so the selection right now will move to the, the expert in order to consider for any new license of the vaccine is a cost effectiveness or not, uh, and approved to be our benefit. And also advice for monitor the cold chain set the standard operation practice for us. And the pharmacist in the hospital becomes the operation instead. And the GPO have to work for all uh, that I have mentioned that have to work uh, begin from negotiation, price negotiation, deliver, and monitor for the coaching. Uh, the decrease of the warehouse is a uh, will be easy for you to set up any of the well design of the co room. Uh, in the past, we spent a lot money in order to set the standard for all of the warehouse. But right now, we just set uh, the standard for the national warehouse and at the uh, hospital only. So I, I think this, uh, this is also the cost that we have to consider more. Anybody else want to address that, William? Nobody? Okay. okay. Thank you. I think uh, we are at the end uh, of the session, so I would like to thank all presenters. You made my life easy <laughs> by following the rules we set this morning uh, together. And for the active participation, special thanks uh, to the moderator also. Uh, Colleagues from WHO and uh, UNICEF uh, headquarters have provided uh, global updates, uh, new guidelines, technical materials, uh, and where to find them. I think uh, it was clear from Rihanna Ryan and from um, Dana, as well about uh, the hub and partnership that is being developed. Um, experiences from seven countries um, that uh, illustrate the approach to supply chain design and redesign from level jumping, informed push distribution, optimizing transport, and transport routes, implementing moving warehouse, and outsourcing distribution to the private sector. And all these in a context uh, either of most of them in stable countries, but also of uh, fragile states like uh, uh, Somalia. Um, but as Ryan, and I have that uh, when you said it uh, early in the morning, that system design is a continuous process and it is not one or another intervention. Uh, but often a combination of most or of all what we have heard since this morning. So, um, the presentations that we had illustrated some challenges also with immunization supply chain fundamentals and how fixing some of the basics in vaccine management is equally important when designing supply chain. Uh, something I wanted to mention also is uh, from inception in piloting, because uh, we have a lot of piloting also happening. 
uh, we should integrate, if successful, how I will scale up. Because I think it's something that is missing, but I think we can discuss that in the afternoon. And because a Senegalese proverb is saying, meaning good things are never enough, uh, I would like to uh, invite all of you to go participate in these afternoon sessions and uh, to tell to everybody also bon appétit with the cuisine Thai. Yeah. Thai cuisine. Mm. Yeah. So uh, now I would like uh, maybe Ryan to give some informations before we go for lunch. Thank you, everybody. Right. So be very fast. So uh, just looking at everything that's on the menu for the afternoon, just going to point out that uh, for all the presentations that were given this morning, the afternoon sessions give you an opportunity to go into more detail. So if you have more specific questions, you're, you're going to have more specific moderated discussions around these topics as well as other topics. And so if I were to tie it back into the, the toolkit that I described earlier, there's a lot of great evidence, but we don't want that evidence to be trapped in these presentations or in this room. You know, we want that information to be available so we can, you know, lowering the fully immunized, cost for fully immunized child uh, in Mozambique, uh, wastage um, ratios in Benin, uh, how to house this within the EVM process, you know, within uh, Myanmar, Uganda, and Somalia. Mm -hmm. These are all different topics that you can look into more this afternoon, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the CDC example. So setting up uh, system design, how do you set that process up, which can be a long-term process, who do you involve, that's part of the afternoon sessions, as well as uh, effective, comprehensive, effective vaccine management. So putting this into practice as part of a programmatic context of routine immunization and health system strengthening uh, will be uh, discussed today. And then, so I urge you to, to look at the, at the program. So on page, let's see, page 15, you can read about the lunch uh, round table in the New York room. Uh, pages 16 and 17 are all these, the sessions that are taking place this afternoon. Uh, but then there's also on page 36, the Innovation Cafe, which is taking place right out here, uh, right after lunch. And then uh, page 34, the Manufacturer's Marketplace is also uh, open. And then page 40, the Project Gallery space, which is down on, on level one, I think. Uh, all, of the, all of this is available at different times today, so please check out your agenda. Okay, enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much.